A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one about whom Jesus wrote in the law, and also the prophets, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. But Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Here is a true child of Israel. There is no duplicity in him. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him and said to him, Before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. And he said to him, Amen, amen, I say to you, he will see heaven open that the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Good morning to you, brothers and sisters. Hope you're all well today. So we'll begin, as always, with our prayer to St. Monica. St. Monica, troubled wife and mother, many sorrows pierced your heart during your lifetime, yet you never despaired or lost faith. With confidence, persistence, and profound faith, you prayed daily for the conversion of your beloved husband, Patricius, and your beloved son, Augustine. Grant me that same fortitude, patience, and trust in the Lord, Intercede for me, dear Saint Monica, for these people. And grant me the grace to accept his will in all things, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So if you'd just like to sit for a little while, just share a few thoughts with you. I mentioned during the week that I have a, a role to play in the formation of our new priests in the Irish Dominicans in Dublin. And our last ordination last year hit the headlines a little because the man getting ordained had uh, played football or soccer, as we say, at the highest level in the English Premier League. And therefore, all the journalists were quite interested in him. So the rest of the students had to sit back and allow him have yet another moment of glory when he was ordained. So his name is Father Philip Mulrine, and Philip went away from home at the age of 16. He was uh, hired by Manchester United, who were England's most successful football team, at least at that stage, not so much now. And he played there alongside some of the biggest names in English football, um, which won't mean too much in the US, but it's a huge thing in Europe. And so he was all the time living with and chatting with all his heroes, all those that every teenager would be starry-eyed about. And during his years as a, as a footballer, he made huge money. So he was able to buy these big houses out in the, in the country. But more than anything, he was able to buy cars that he had been looking at as a teenager and wishing that he could have. And it was when he finally managed to, to buy the cars of his dreams that the first chink in his armor appeared. Because he'd buy this car, it would be top, top class model, and after a month, he'd be looking at it and saying, yeah, a bit tired of it now. So he'd go and he'd change it after a month. And he sort of started asking himself, what's wrong with me that I can't be satisfied with all these uh, huge material things that, uh, that he was able to buy. At the same time, he had a sister by the name of Annette, who was the religious one in the family. And Annette used to phone him every week, and she'd never failed to ask him if he'd been to Mass on Sunday. And of course, the answer was always no. But she'd ask him anyway, and he'd say no. And she'd send him on books, and he'd say, oh yeah, that's more rubbish from Annette. And he'd put it up on the, on the shelf. 
and never read it. So that was fine. That was the type of relationship they had, that she was always pressing him on faith and he was always happily saying no. And uh, they still got on very well. And so it went on for years. So she was a little bit like St. Monica for him, except that St. Augustine was always thinking, whereas our Philip wasn't thinking about anything except his next football match. So one day he had this funny idea. I think he was captain of the team that day and it was a big match and he was passing the cathedral in Norwich in his, the city where he was and he decided he'd go in and say a prayer. And it was the first time in years that he'd gone into a church and he knelt down and he prayed for success in the match. And in that match, he broke his leg and he was uh, taken off on a stretcher. And that was more or less the end of his career because he found himself during the time that he was recovering uh, to be restless and he never really got going again after that. And so eventually he decided to call it a day. He left his girlfriend, his football career, his, his home and his money, and he went back to Belfast, really wondering what he was going to do with his life again. And Annette's husband brought him down to uh, a homeless hostel run by Catholic volunteers. And there he went in, he saw all these men, just like his football team, except that they were kneeling, saying the rosary. So instead of pleasing the fans and pleasing themselves, they were out to please God and their neighbor. So I suppose he learned two things, one of which is that you can have as much money and success as you like, but happiness doesn't lie in that. Happiness is something interior. And the second thing is how dangerous it is to have someone praying for your conversion and to keep you in touch with the faith because you just might need them someday when you're wondering what you're going to do with life or what is life really about. So we're told in the gospel, according to Luke as well, that once upon a time, Jesus was praying and the disciples were watching him. And when he finished, his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. What were they looking at when they were looking at Jesus praying? What did they see in him that they didn't see in others as he was praying? And I suppose it was probably that they saw that he was praying to a father, that he was conscious of himself as a son praying to the father. And Jesus, in reply to their question to teach them to pray, taught them the Our Father. So Jesus was, was praying like nobody else had prayed before, as a son to his father, and then he taught them as well. He taught all his disciples to come into that relationship with God as father. And we read in St. Luke's Gospel that once Jesus had taught the disciples the Our Father, he tells them this funny story about prayer. And it's about a man, and he says to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. So the friend has to keep on knocking until he annoys his neighbor enough that he'll get up and give him the bread. And this is the lesson in prayer. Now consider that Jesus has just been talking about the Our Father, and then he tells us this parable. So what's part of the point here is that he's comparing God the Father to a cranky man in the middle of the night down the street who doesn't want to be annoyed. And how strange is that? Surely Jesus could have chosen a better parable than that to describe God the Father, something more sublime or more holy. But then he does tell another parable with the same message. So we read, and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor regarded man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, vindicate me against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow annoys me, I will vindicate her or she will wear me out. So Jesus, in teaching us to pray often, compares God the Father, first of all, to a cranky old man, and secondly, to a mafia judge. How strange is that? And I think we needn't doubt 
that Jesus told these parables with a smile on his face and a twinkle of laughter in his eye. And that's why he's willing to, to joke about God the Father when he tells us this. And I imagine that it's because the God who effortlessly laid out the entire universe has called himself our Father and that he sent Jesus with this message that God himself is our Father. And it's because of that, when we pray, even if we're desperate, even if we're getting no answer, nonetheless, we're praying to nobody else than our Father, who is all-powerful. And so we say in the Mass, when we're about to pray the Our Father, we say, at the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say. And why do we dare to say it? Isn't it because God is so powerful, and yet we give him a title that's so close to us, the, the title of Father. And how strange is this, and how daring is this? And so Jesus tells these two parables, these funny parables, with a smile on his face and a twinkle in his eye, because he's not giving us a sober academic idea of prayer and of how God answers and why he doesn't answer sometimes, but he's simply saying to us, that we can trust. We can pray. When we pray, we entrust ourselves into the hands of our Father. And so we must be safe. And he goes on. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Very difficult thing to believe, isn't it? But he insists, for everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. And then he goes on to compare God the Father to our earthly fathers. And he says, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So my father died just under two years ago. And a few weeks ago, when I was at home with my mother and my brother, we were reminiscing, as we often do, and my mother said, and I think we had agreed, that he would do anything for his children. Now, my father was no saint, but we could say that in truth nonetheless, that he would do anything for his children. So if that's true of, our, of an earthly father, imagine God, who is all good, all holy, all powerful, that he'll do anything for his children, and his children are us. There's a charming little comment by St. Augustine on St. Monica in the Confessions, where St. Augustine has moved to Africa, and St. Monica pursues him. And he says, But now my mother, strong in her love, had come to me, for she had followed me over land and sea, kept safe by you, by God, through all her perils. And St. Augustine says that, even though it was usual for sailors to reassure inexperienced passengers of their safety at sea, this time it was the inexperienced passenger Monica, who reassured the sailors because of her trust in God and his promises. So may, may we too, who bring our loved ones to the Lord for the gift of faith, or who bring all our intentions uh, to the Lord for the gift of faith, may we too have that confidence which allowed St. Monica to happily abandon her prayers to her father and to grow in trust year by year. As Jesus says, ask and it will be given you Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. So through St. Jude, as well, we bring all our prayers to God. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many, but the Church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases, Pray for me who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations, and sufferings, and particularly in this request. and that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jude, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. 
Saint Jude, pray for us and for all who honor and invoke thy aid. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.